Lord, we recognize and confess that you are sovereign, but we also hear in your word that you command us to pray. And we thank you for the privilege of coming before your throne and, and asking for things and praising you and just marveling at your majesty. And today, Lord, I just pray that every single heart and mind in here is, is able to rest under your sovereign hand, knowing that they have forgiveness through belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ. And as these things continue to go forth over the Internet or any other means, I just pray that as the seeds go forth, that your, war, that your word would find uh, good, good soil. And as we know, Lord, as we studied in this class, you are the only one that can till the heart and make the soil able to receive the word implanted. Most of all, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for sending him. We thank you that you chose us before the foundation of the world in him. And we look forward to his return when we know you are going to raise us up with him. In his name we pray. Amen. I started, if you recall, going back 10, 11 weeks, I began the course speaking about attitude. And the avenue I was uh, addressing there was our attitude as far as being uh, approaching the Word of God. And I highlighted, I brought up John chapter 6 and highlighted our need to put ourselves under the Word of God and submitting ourselves to its teaching. And that humbled attitude is so essential, not only to this area, but every single area of uh, doctrine and theology. The, uh, the ability to receive the Word, as we know, comes from God. So uh, that has been very evident as we have progressed through the teachings on divine sovereignty. But, in the compatibilistic view of things... We are commanded to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. So those things, again, are working in, in, uh, in unison with one another. So I started with the issue of attitude. And I want to finish tonight on stressing issues of attitude. So this is going to be applied, in one very real sense, applying what we have learned through the first nine weeks of this class. And the first area I want to address is what should be our response now that we have seen, that we have heard, that we have taken in the word regarding the teaching of God's sovereignty. And as I hope you have uh, understood throughout this class, the doctrine of God's sovereignty isn't, not, isn't just one small doctrine in the midst of many, it is a doctrine that filters into every single area of our theology and into our practice. So, I want us to consider what should be our response, what should be our attitude in light of what we've learned. And I think one of the best places to go to is Psalm 139. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 139. Now this is actually one of the more well-known psalms. We can think of Psalm 23 as probably the most famous psalm. And then we have Psalm 22, Psalm 91, and uh, Psalm 139 is right along there with them as a famous psalm because uh, there's, there's a lot of language in here that has found its way into worship songs and hymns throughout the years. But what this psalm really is, and it's a psalm of David, it's a psalm reflecting on the characteristics of God, the characteristics of His omnipotence, His omnipresence, and omniscience. Now, all those things are speaking of God being all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-present everywhere. And all those things are very much related to the sovereignty of God. Now, I want us to pay attention to David's attitude regarding the sovereignty of God. The psalm begins, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise, rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, 
Behold, Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. So a couple points here. Number one, David is, is reflecting on how God is intimately acquainted with all his ways. And before a word is on his tongue, the Lord completely knows it. So that is speaking to the foreknowledge of God, which is an issue related to the sovereignty of God, which we've addressed in this course. Behold, O Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before. This is speaking, another way this has been translated is you hem me in. Behind and before. So this is speaking of the person being in, enveloped in God's sovereignty. And we're going to see that again later in the psalm as we progress. But what's David's response? You laid your hand upon me. That's, I, I think this is David referring to God's graciousness to him. You have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. So David's view of the Lord's sovereignty, his omnipresence, that he is intimately acquainted with everything he's going on, it didn't, so to speak, cramp David's style, thinking I'm not free here, because the Lord has encompassed and closed me behind and before. Rather, his attitude was, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. This is grand. This is great. And we'll read this again as we go on. Let's skip forward to verses 16 and 17. I encourage you to read the whole psalm if you're not familiar with it. A few verses later, after speaking of God's omnipresence, being unable to flee from the the Lord, your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them how precious are your thoughts to me O god how vast is the sum of them so david makes a very clear statement of predestination does he not here in your book and i think this is figuratively speaking that God has a figurative book that he has written the story of everyone's life of all their days. Were written the days that were ordained for me when as yet there was not one of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How vast is the sum of them. So David's view not only was speaking of, of, of wonder earlier in the psalm, here he speaks of How precious these things are. So, God predestining things here is specifically, this isn't just anything, this is specifically related to David's life. So this is intimately personal. He doesn't see this as an offense. David, the great king, the forerunner, whom the Lord promised, through his seed all the nations of the earth would be blessed. He declares regarding these things, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. His response is praise. He sees these things as precious. So I see, I, I see in Psalm 139 a proper attitude of the redeemed reflecting on our standing before the, our, our holy God. He has laid his hand upon all of us. And we can rejoice. And say these things are wonderful and these things are precious. Because, and I, I, I hope you echo those things along with me. Because as we look through what we have learned, that we were chosen before the foundation of the world, that Jesus' blood completely atones for us, that we are secure in the grip of his grace, and that we have the promise of eternal life. All these things are related to God's sovereignty. Therefore, we can speak of how precious these things are because these things are the hope of our salvation. These are the anchor that we read of in Hebrews. So that that's just one, one avenue, one aspect of the sovereignty of God that I want us to reflect on as far as attitude goes. 
I think our attitude regarding these things, as I spoke of before, we need to, uh, these things should humble us, and, I, and I'll get to that. That's going to be my final point tonight. These things have to humble us. If these things don't humble you, something's wrong. However, they're also a reason for rejoicing because we are secured by the sovereign one who rules the whole universe. And because he is that sovereign one, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. So uh, that's, that's one point. So uh, the, the title is, is Resting and Working, or Working and Resting in the Sovereignty of God. So in one sense, the sovereignty of God should cause us to rest. And personally, I can attest to you that it wasn't until I understood the sovereignty of God, it wasn't until then that I actually really had a lasting assurance of my salvation. Because I understood that it was God's work, not mine. Before then, I always had this creeping feeling in my heart and mind knowing, you know what, if it's up to me, I really could screw this whole thing up. But when I realized that it doesn't depend on man's desire or effort, but God who has mercy, and that he has promised to finish what he started, that just the floodgates opened as far as assurance goes, and I was able to rest in the sovereignty of God. So that's one thing, resting. But we also, getting back to our compatible, compatibilism, compatibilistic framework, we rest, but we also are called to work. And remember why we work out. Let's read this again. I know this is a text that we have addressed a couple times, but I think it's good for us to remind us of this text because this text, perhaps more than anyone, at least in a practical matter, speaks to the aspect of compatibilism. So then, my beloved, Philippians 2, 12 through 14, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your your, your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work, For his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Just to recap, thumbnail sketch recap here. Work out your salvation with with fear and trembling. Now, again, I always like to say this because it's so easy to misread. This isn't saying work for your salvation. This is work out. Something that is already a reality in your life, you are called to work out. And this is, this is an imperative here. Work out. Be active. Take heed. Labor. Strive. This is a command. And we see these, I mean, the commands are given over and over again in Scripture. And oftentimes, we, we, uh, those who believe in, in sovereignty have needed to be aware that there's this practical pitfall of fatalism that we want to avoid. Thinking, God, well, God's, God's predestined it all, so what can I do? Compatibilism fights that. That's why I, I like the term compatibilism. And this teaches that. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So both things are true here. And that's why when we run into commands in the Scripture, we need to wake up and be aware that these are things, binding commands that are given, that's given by our Lord, those are things we must obey. We must strive. Not for our salvation, but work it out because God has called us to. We want to be obedient. Why do we want to be obedient? Because God has given us that desire. Previously, all we wanted to do was run after our sin and our, and our own desires. God has changed us. So when we are working out our salvation, the only way anyone can work out their salvation is if God is working in them. And that's what this verse teaches. So rest in the sovereignty of God, but also work in the sovereignty of God. And the reason why I added this last verse here, or this last portion here, do all things without grumbling or disputing, is 
I think in one sense, when, when we understand the sovereignty of God, and we understand its practical implications as we have throughout this course, this should be easier. I'm not saying it is, because we're by nature grumblers. But if we truly believe that God is sovereign and he is working all things together for the good of those who love him, whether good or bad, then whatever comes across our path, whether good or bad, we should submit ourselves to his sovereign plan, saying, thy will be done, rather than grumbling, saying, well, why am I handed this lot? Do all things without grumbling or disputing. This speaks, I think, to humility. And what's the opposite of grumbling? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Thankfulness. And how many times are we exhorted to be thankful? And I think when we sit back and reflect on what the Lord has done for us, and that He is indeed at work in us, this should produce, rather than grumbling, but thanksgiving. Even in the midst of dire and hurtful and grievous circumstances. Why? Because we hold on to that promise that God is working all things together for the good of those who love Him. And the truth of that promise is rooted in His sovereignty. Because the way, the reason why He is able to, and indeed does work all things together for the good of those who love Him, is because He is sovereign. Therefore, we are called as a community who recognize these things by His grace to rest in His sovereignty And I could, another one, rejoice in his sovereignty, but also to work, to labor. It's not something that breeds slothfulness. This should be something that motivates us. Because this is an act of grace. It's an effectual grace that causes his people to go forth in the gospel and in obedience to his word. So remember why we work out our salvation with fear, in fear and trembling. Now, I've had several people ask me, and I, I can't tell you how joyful it is when I hear this, because uh, it's, it's the response that a teacher wants to hear, is, is how, how can I share this with others? The reason why that's a wonderful thing for a teacher to hear is not only have they learned what you've been teaching, but they're excited about it. They're passionate about taking what they have seen as precious and sharing it with other people. So how do we share this with others? And I'll I'll offer some specifics because specifics are, are somewhat subjective as to how. I'll offer maybe some of the things that I have done over the last 10 10 or so years as I have longed to share this with other people. But I want to again go back to the issue of attitude. And this verse, as far as practice in ministry, has probably been the most influential verse uh, in my ministerial life so-called career so far. I don't like the word career because we're, we're servants. This isn't, the, this isn't a job. I don't see this as a job. Um, but I'll use it anyway. The reason why I find this so significant is because it gives us the marching orders on how we are called to teach. How we are called to share. And here is 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 25a, and there's going to be more after this. The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. Now, I, um, I confess that I have fallen short of this many times. But this, this is the goal, this is the standard that I strive to reflect. And 
when this when it comes to the issue of sharing the 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 issues and the points in the scriptures and the arguments of the sovereignty of God and all the things related, as several of you may already know, this can be a very contentious issue. Things can get rather dicey. I have heard several times after discussing these things with certain people, somebody flat out say, that's not my God. And from there, the it's never gotten really much better. But this is one of the most contentious doctrines in the church. And I think a part of it has to do with the emotional aspects of this. We're all born thinking we have a natural ability to do good. And we're all born with the, the view that we're owed something. And this view puts humanity in its place as sinners and enemies of God that are not seeking Him at all. And out of that back, black backdrop comes the light of sovereign grace, which is really, as, as Paul says in Romans 11, otherwise grace would no longer be grace, because it's not by works. But this is the attitude that, not only in this area of theology, but any area of theology, we need to be reflecting. Do not be quarrelsome. That doesn't mean that the quarrels might not come about. They probably will. But our command is to not be quarrelsome, to fight against that. Be kind to all, able to teach. You might have people say really bad things about you. <laughs> be patient and be gentle, correcting those who are in opposition. Now, this in, in the context here, I, I want to be careful that I, I'm handling the Scriptures accurately here. In the context here, Paul isn't specifically addressing the Calvinist versus Arminian issue. That's, that's not what was going on in the context of 2 Timothy. There was some sort of false teaching in the background. We, we aren't exactly sure what it was. 2 Timothy gives some indication of some of the false teaching that was going on within the church. But some of it was related to the issue of the resurrection and other things that can be ascertained throughout a, a careful reading of the epistle. But let's move on because, again, the doctrine of sovereignty is given by Paul here. If perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil having been held captive by him to do his will. So the, the attitudes that we are to, to seek to emulate, not be quarrelsome, be kind, to be patient, and gently correcting people, all is in light of the fact that God's the one that grants repentance. And that this repentance, a godly repentance, leads to the knowledge of the truth. That they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. Now, I think that this, whatever situation Paul was dealing with here in writing to Timothy, was probably a more severe one than what we're talking about is with, with the issue of, of sovereign grace and those who haven't come to grips with it yet. But if this is how t Paul exhorted Timothy to handle these people, how much more should we act like this when discussing these things with our brothers and sisters in Christ? And it's, it's kind of, the word Calvinist has kind of become a caricature in a lot of people's minds as, as mean, rude people who just want to bang you over the head with the Bible. And I, that's a total caricature, and in all honesty, coming from the other side of the spectrum, uh, I see that way far less than the other side does. I see, what I see is, is 
so many of, of our great people. For instance, uh, John MacArthur uh, is, would, would consider himself a, ca- a Calvinist. And he so often, when you hear him speak and interacting with people, handles himself I- in a gracious, kind manner. But never compromising the truth. And I could go on a, a list of, of so many others. So I think that's a caricature. But as far as, as breaking down that caricature that people have in their minds of those who, who hold the sovereign grace as being, as being bullies, let's, let's have it all start with us. With Starting here. Let's, be, let's, let's reflect what Paul instructs Timothy to do. Be patient, be kind, and gently correct. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading the knowledge of truth. Let me tell you a story um, regarding the conflict between Calvinism and Arminianism. Uh, there's there's been many figureheads of, of like Calvin and Arminianism is is the the main one that is used. But Luther versus Erasmus is another one that many of the same issues were going on, and another one was Wesley and Whitfield. This is all a couple centuries ago, somewhat across the pond. Some of them came over here. But uh, George Whitfield died before John Wesley. And they were, they were known to be people who were uh, vigorously disagreeing on the doctrines of grace. Whitfield would be considered what we would call Calvinist, and Wesley would be considered Armenian. Now, Wesley is, is where most of the Methodist churches have sprouted from. Now, someone asked, now, this Whit, Whitfield was a Calvinist. Someone asked John Wesley, do you think you're going to see Whitfield, George Whitfield, in heaven? And Wesley said, no. And everybody was shocked. And then Wesley said, he'll be so close to the throne I won't even see him. And I thought that was such a gracious way to deal. And this is coming from the other side of the spectrum here. I disagree with Wesley's soteriology. But that's the type of tone that I would love to see introduced into this debate because it so much more reflects what we've been looking at here. Gently correcting. Being kind to all. Patient. So... That's just uh, a thumbnail sketch there regarding, before I get to this here, I'll, some, some people have asked, well, how? What, what do you think is, is, is the best way to share these things with other people? What I have found to be most effective in, in my discussing these things with other Christians who disagree with me on the sovereignty of God I personally, and this is by no means a law, this is just what I have found to be very effective as far as advancing the conversation in a, in a good way and making an, an impact at first. I usually start with John chapter 6. Now, we've, we've, seen, we've gone through John chapter 6 quite a bit through, through now. And if you remember, there was a great crowd following Jesus, and Jesus presents many hard truths to this crowd one about eating the flesh and drinking the blood, and the other that no one can come to him unless the Father draws that person, which is a a powerful, in a sense almost airtight, statement regarding sovereign effectual grace. And we went through that. If you don't remember that, I encourage you to go back and review that. Here's why I find it effective. Number one, it gets down to a very, very central text regarding this. It's in a, but it's also in a narrative that people were offended at what Jesus said. And they walked away. They left him. And I think that's a good place to use the scriptures to, in a sense, challenge us all, including the person reading. Are, would you walk away from Jesus if he said this to you? And that's why I think some people, I, when it's coming straight from the mouth of their Lord, I think people oftentimes wake up a little faster and say, well, maybe, maybe I better look at this a little more closely. And actually, I, I told the story before, an, an individual that I had discussed these things with 
several years ago, like almost 10 years ago. That was, that was the passage that God used to awaken him to the doctrines of sovereign grace, was John 6. He, what, what he said is, I just couldn't find a way to make it say what it, what it actually says. He wanted to make it say something else, but he said there was no way around it. I could not get around it. He said, I don't like it yet, but I believe it's true. And within a couple of weeks, he was, he was liking it. He was loving it. So that's obviously that, that, that's just a starting point. We certainly want to go get, get into Romans 9 through 11, which is really the Scripture's place where it, it's devoted to speaking on this matter. And Ephesians 1 and 2 are also very prime areas where we want to we want to go because that's really where Scripture is specifically addressing the issue of predestination, effectual grace, and the like. So th- those are just some general things that I've observed as helpful in my sharing these things with other people. Attitude, remember, is so important too. We, we want to be gracious carriers of the Word of God. Finally... I want to conclude the class with us remembering Job. Because I think Job's answer here is exemplary. And this is what all of us are called to align ourselves with if we we do a real good reading of Job and confess with Job the things that he does. Now, the context of Job, if you recall, but I'll do a quick thumbnail sketch so we remember this, that Job was, by God's permission, even direction, at the beginning of Job, his life was was ruined through many different means. And he had several comforters saying that this must be because you're, you're, you're more sinful. Something is in your life that is causing these things to happen. God arrives on the scene towards the end of the narrative and doesn't tell Job why, but simply proclaims his own power and right over his own creation. And this is Job's confession after the Lord has declared all these things. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. That's a confession of God's sovereignty. He confesses God is sovereign and he has the right to do with his creation what he wills. He is good. He is right. He is sovereign. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? He's repeating what God challenged him with. Therefore, this is Job speaking again, I have declared that which I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here now and I will speak, I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Job was confronted with the all-holy, all-powerful, sovereign Lord of Israel, sovereign Lord of all there is. And this was his response. So as we've studied throughout this course, we have run into many things that are mysterious. Many things that we just have to confess we do not know. And sometimes that's very hard. Because mystery is not something that we, we, we like. We pursue knowledge. We want to know why. But here... Job confesses, now he he came into the presence of the Lord. He has seen him. His eyes see him. Therefore, I retract and I repent in dust and ashes. Job was humbled. Humbled by the Holy Sovereign One. And my prayer is that we have this humility before the Lord. Because uh, this would... It's better to, to have this type of humility now than to go into his presence unprepared. Because everybody, when they enter into the presence of God, is humbled one way or another. It's good to be humbled willingly. Because every knee will bow one day. So this is 
what I want to leave you with is remember Job's confession. And remember, again, what we talked about tonight, resting and working in the sovereignty of God. Both, it's, it's somewhat of a paradox, but it's true. We rest from our works in the sense that we cannot earn our salvation. We can do nothing because salvation is of the Lord. But because God has begun this great work in us, and He has promised He's going to finish it, we are called to work out our salvation. With what? With fear and trembling. Like Job was in fear and trembling before the hand of our sovereign God. So let's, let's finish with, just with the lecture here in prayer. Then we'll take ten minutes and we'll have a good forty minutes of time to discuss and interact regarding anything uh, that we have studied in the last uh, ten weeks. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have laid your hand upon us. You have given us the most precious gift of all, which is eternal life and the promise of spending eternity with Jesus. And Lord, we we cannot wait to, to meet our King face to face and bow before Him. But now, Lord, as we strive to be conformed to Your image, we pray that You continue to work in us that good work and cause us to fix our heart and our mind upon Your Word and upon Your Son so that we might be good stewards with what You've given us and faithfully fulfill the ministries that You've given to each and every one of us. We love You and we thank You in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, here's, here's what we're going to do. Um, Bob has an, an, an example of compatibilism that he wants to share, which I think is profitable, so I'll let him do that first, but here's the, kind of the way we're going to do it. We're, we're going to end up I'm going to take field questions from you, but we've all, as I indicated, we have an internet audience, so I printed off some of the questions that they've asked people that aren't able to attend here, wherever they're at, across the world, across the country, and I'll bring some of these up as we go along, uh, because some of these are, are, are real good ones that I think we should, uh, we should bring about. So go ahead, Bob, take it away. This is about Esau. Okay. I want to show you why believing everything the Bible says literally forces one to believe that compatibilism is true. All right? And we're going to illustrate this. This came up in our Bible study on Revelation. And we had a good discussion. I thought it was probably the best illustration I've ever seen of what Ryan's been teaching in this class. So let's start. I think let's start in Hebrews 12, 16. I'll just take you through a little discussion of the Esau narrative in the Bible and show how both God's purpose and God's sovereignty and human responsibility are both true. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says, well, I'll start with verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defiled that there be no immoral or godless person like Esau who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought for it with tears. So Esau is called, uh, literally in the Greek, the word can be translated secular. Godless there means secular. Um, despising the promise. So when he despised his birthright, what he would despise was the promises that God gave to Abraham. Because the one who would get the birthright would be a descendant of Abraham and Isaac, and therefore would be the next in line to carry on the messianic promises that were given to Abraham. So he despised Christ ahead of time Mm -hmm. by despising the promises to Abraham. So he was a wicked and godless man. Now turn with me to Romans 9 and verse 10. Okay, Romans 9 and verse 10. Verse 10. And not only this, but there was Rebecca also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and not had, had not done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older were served the younger. So the point Paul's making is that God determined that the blessing would go to Jacob 
before he was born or before either Jacob or Esau had done anything. Okay? So it couldn't have been determined by what they did. It was determined by God's purpose. That's the point. And then it says, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as is written, Jacob I loved him, but Esau I hated. And then notice how Paul anticipates what people are going to think about what he just wrote. He does that a lot of times. He, he anticipates objections and then refutes it. What shall we say, say there? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. Now, here's his answer. Because he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So Paul's answer to the charge of injustice is that God is sovereignly able to have mercy on anybody he wants. And he chose Jacob, and it's God's prerogative to do that, and that's what God did. So one passage says that the interpret the event to be the immoral wickedness of Esau to despise the covenant. Another passage interprets it to be God's sovereign purpose going forward. Now, compatibilism says we have to believe both passages are absolutely true. And that uh, if, if that doesn't make sense to us, we can always say we don't understand it, but we can't turn around and say, no, God can't do this or God can't do that or this is not true or this is and try to get rid of part of what God said. If we get rid of what God says, we're making ourselves pagan. Everything we refuse to believe that God said, we're that much more pagan than we would be. Because the only difference between Christians and pagans is, is that we have what God said. Pagans don't know. They're just fishing around like Job's buddies were. Yeah. And okay. I actually, I, while I was driving around or driving here tonight, I was just reflecting on compatibilism. And I was really thinking, you know, I, I don't think there's any other way you can, you can actually believe every single scripture in the Bible without being a compatibilist. Because there's so many scriptures uh-huh. that declare God is absolutely sovereign. There are so many scriptures that declare humans are responsible, moral agents. I mean, it, it's, the Bible is just full of it. And to just choose to believe God is sovereign, we're responsible, we, we're and accountable, I, I, don't know what, I wouldn't know what to do with the Bible if I just didn't rest in what is taught both in the uh, spectrums of compatibilism. God is sovereign. Humans are responsible. Go All right. Ahead. Now, one more thing. We're going to go back and see what actually happened in Genesis now. Now, remember it said the younger will serve the older, which is true, cited. But let's see how this play, played out in Genesis, what had actually happened, and see if we see any light. Uh, let's just skip forward to about verse 34. Genesis, oh, excuse me, 27. 27. I had it open. What was wrong with you? <laughs> Genesis 2734. Let's just see. I think you know the story about how Jacob tricked his father. His father was not inclined to bless Jacob with the, with the birthright, but he tricked him to get it. All right? Now, and then Esau finds out there isn't anything left, and the blessing he finally gets is a curse. All right? Esau, verse, 30, verse 34. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me even also, O my father. Now this is what Hebrews was referring to. And he said, Your brother came deceitfully and has deceitfully and taken away your blessing. And then he said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright, and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. He says, have you not reserved a blessing for me? So he couldn't, repentance he couldn't find, even though he saw it with tears, was to try to give back what he already had sold. That's what, that was what Hebrews was talking about. He couldn't get it back because he sold it. It's gone. It's gone. Jacob. It went to Jacob. You're not getting it back. So that's why he couldn't find repentance. Now, here's what, I, uh, verse 37 Isaac answered and said to Esau, Behold, I have made him your master, and all his relatives I have given to him as servants, and with grain and new wine I have sustained him. Now as for you then, what can I do, my son? And Esau said, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me 
also of all my father, and he wept. And Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fertility of the earth shall be your dwelling, away from the dew of heaven from above. And by your sword you shall live, and your brother you shall serve. But it shall come about when you become reckless, restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. Verse 41. So Esau bore a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. So not only did he despise the promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, yeah, and Jacob, but he, Esau, became the first anti Semite. (laughs) He became the first one who wanted to kill the promise that God gave Abraham. Because at that point, Jacob had no sons. And if Esau kills him, nobody will be blessed. There will be no Messiah. There will be no promise to Abraham. So he, he, was a, he, was, he had the very first pogrom against the Jews in history. Right there. Kill the only person who can inherit the blessing from Abraham. So Esau deservedly was called a wicked, evil, godless, immoral man. Now, did Esau have any options? Let's just talk about human responsibility. What could have Esau done? Well, the promises were through Jacob. He could submit to him, as he was told to do by his father, but he wouldn't do it. He, he broke away. So he, he could have been saved. He could have been part of the family of blessing, but it had to just come to him through Jacob, and he couldn't stand that idea, so he, he despised it. All right. Now, God's purpose went forward, and Esau got no injustice. Esau made a decision to sell. Esau made a decision to try to kill Jacob. He got what he deserved. And God's purpose went forward. That's compatibilism in a nutshell. Does that make sense? (laughs) Okay. And and here's another point. I just thought of this while you were saying this. Uh, Free exposition here, no extra charges, he would say. Regarding Hebrews... What's the purpose of Hebrews? This is why this would be such a powerful warning to, the, to, to, the, to those who to are reading. The and to those, yeah, but mostly believing Israelites who want to go back to the temple. Exactly. Yep. So the, the, here's the issue. They're saying don't, don't be like Esau. Now, an Israelite, at that, every Israelite would hear the name Esau and, oh, despised, a bad character on the scene, mm-hmm. not well respected. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Esau, an enemy. And he's saying, don't be like Esau. Now, Esau hated his birthright, despised the birthright. What was Israel's birthright? Messiah. Messiah. So, yes, the covenant. So the the whole book of Hebrews is about don't despise your birthright. Mm -hmm. Messiah. So, therefore, don't be like Esau. Don't despise your birthright. Rather, believe in Messiah. Don't go back to the temple. Because if you go back to the temple... You You're despising birth. yeah. your birthright. The true birthright like is Messiah, and it was yep. back then, because it was said to Abraham, in thy seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I did a whole, we have a DVD out on it. I did a whole sermon applying that one verse to the evangelical church, accusing the church of despising its birthright. Yep. Okay, all right. let's open it up. Lots of questions. Come on, hands up. Ironically, what you have been um, talking tonight I spent two hours talking to a, a friend of mine, a sister in Christ, who was in grief because of a husband who had been witnessing in a way with the right motive but the wrong way mm-hmm. and has been shutting out his family and willing to make peace and not willing to make peace. And it just really just burdened my heart mm-hmm. because it's for the cost of Christ that Paul is willing to be anything and do anything for his cause. Mm-hmm. And um, because when you are truly saved by grace, no longer do you practice good works because out of guilt, but it's out of gratefulness mm-hmm. for what he did for you on the cross and that he has chosen you mm-hmm. to become his. And in Galatians, as I, was been re- I have been reading for the last two days, chapter 3 in verse, I think, 11, part 3b here, it said, The righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contra- um, contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. And um, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, 
Having become a curse for us, it is written, Curse is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that, is, uh, that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Mm-hmm. And out of all of that, when God is love, because it took love it, to, for him to come down so that he saved us mm-hmm. because of out of love. He said God is love, so we are his product of love. So therefore, when we witness, we're supposed to witness out of love. And there's a definition of love, what love is. And I think um, there are so many that are Bible banging Mm -hmm. to other people that are lacking grace Mm -hmm. and gentleness and humbleness. Mm -hmm. And it just hurts my heart because it is what it is, is that it's actually hurting. Yeah, we have to. I totally agree. That's why I really wanted to bring... Not just my opinion that that's the way it is. That's why I wanted to bring out Second Timothy two. This is God's marching orders to His bond servant. The Lord's bond servant must not be quarrelsome. Now that doesn't mean, I mean, that doesn't mean we're not we're we're, we're going to cease to be offensive. We're naturally going to be offensive because we have an offensive message. It's the nature of the message. So, exactly. But we 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 are to. Uh, I think of Second Corinthians five. Uh, we are ministers of reconciliation, pleading. With the world, be reconciled to God. So, yeah, attitude is, is definitely part of it, and the scriptures speak to that. Thank you, Mr. Couple. We had a, uh, a Bible study last night, and we got hooked on a little portion of uh, the. Uh, it, we're talking about the churches, mm-hmm. and we're talking Revelation 2. And the statement made was, but I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, we're talking about love, okay? Mm-hmm. Talk, you have left your first love. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I'm coming and I'll remove your lampstand. Well, the lampstand, that's kind of like he's going to deal with the church. But the, the first love, what is it? And then the second is what deeds is he to return to? And we looked at this and talked about compatibilism. They're called to do this, and yet if they're believers, he's not pulling their belief out of them. He's not right. taking their salvation away. Right. What's going on? And Bob will have a comment on remembering. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Bob. You were there. <laughs> um, well, one of the things, and I know Ryan dealt with this in the earlier lectures, and we probably did in the discussion. One of the things to always keep in mind is that God has means. Okay? So a, a, a serious warning like that addressed to true believers will shake them up. I mean, Jesus himself is threatening to take us away out of the uh, uh, the lampstand, mm-hmm. same way with Hebrews. Why is it? Why are there five warnings in Hebrews against apostasy? If it's not, if true believers won't apostatize, because the warning is what God uses to keep believers from apostatizing. Okay, and it may shake up some people with false assurance who think they're believers and they really aren't. Yep. Okay, and so it could be a means of, of bringing yeah, definitely the gospel. means. And I think as far as uh, what is you know, the first love there? Well, it's not specifically defined, but I, th- I think if we look at the whole counsel of God, we can see first love, in, in a sense we can think of it whether it's, it's primary like the, or, or what was at first. Either way, love for, love for God and love for neighbor are, are primary throughout the Old and New Testament, love for God and love for neighbor. And we see that obviously that is all fulfilled in, in, in the person and work of Christ, so we, we can't love God and neighbor apart from Christ. So taking all those things together, I think it's a call, and you look at, okay, the, the, yes, they're judging to that position, that's Ephesus, correct? The Church of Ephesus? Uh, they're judging false prophets, and that's good. However, and you know what, this can be a danger in, in that type of thing. I've seen this so much in discernment ministries. Judging, it, it, they, people get so wound up in being able to judge what is right and wrong that they become detached from their love for God and love for neighbor, which is important. We have to have that as the source of testing false prophets and finding them false. Because our love, our love as, as pastors and as elders should be for our, our church, not the love of uh, declaring someone as wrong. You know, that, that's not our love, is, is the ability to be right. 
our love is for, for sheep, for, for the sheep of God's well, pasture. Yeah, preserving pasture. people from sorrow. That's our love. Yeah. And the false teaching is not a privilege. It's a, it's a miserable thing that yep. wrecks your life. And um, we should not want to be right if we're our, we aren't. So we should always be searching the scriptures to make sure that we understand them correctly. The, you know what? That leads to yes, learn. What did I do with my sheep? He, he brought up remember. We had a, I brought my... I've been bringing my computer to Bible study. I sit there in my logos during Bible study. <laughs> so he doesn't have to remember anything. <laughs> Dick, Dick doesn't complain because I get so engrossed in it, I shut up and everyone else does. <laughs> so anyhow, I looked up that word remember, and it's a unique word. It's not just recall. It was a word where when, it was, when you look it up, it means to call to mind some important thing that happened in the past. Okay. Remember Job. Right, and mm-hmm. it's used in it's, you know, one of the places I saw was remember Lot's wife, mm-hmm. and and it has to. It's a very special word, and so the reason we do the Lord's Supper is in order to remember that same idea. Okay, why do we do the Lord's Supper? Because if we don't remember why Christ died and how it is our sins are forgiven, we'll start going astray. So uh, that's a little Bible study we had. I, I want to flush that out sometime, make a nice little article. The, um, this is a nice segue to, uh, let me get to the one of the, you're next, but uh, I'll couple these two together. This is something uh, someone has asked um, through email. Please explain why the doctrine of election is so essential to our faith. And related, is there any scripture reference for the belief that Calvins or Calvinists mature, mature in their faith faster, better than Arminians? I don't know if that argument holds water. I don't think we've ever actually made the statement that Calvinists mature in their faith faster or better than Arminians. We may have implied some, some, some of those, but it's probably from personal experience. I don't think there's a, there's a scripture that says that. Now, there's indications, there's implications. Remember, Calvinism and Arminianism didn't pop up until, you know, several hundred years ago. So that Calvinism and Arminianism isn't going to be in the Bible. However, the principles that they talk about are. The one passage that I, I would say is uh, is indicative of why these things are important is in Ephesians chapter 1. And in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prays that the Father of glory may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. This is uh, starting with 17. So that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. I would argue that Paul is praying that they understand effectual grace. What is the, per, what, what is the power of his, the hope of his calling? We've, we've studied what calling is. In this uh, course, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe? And right after this, in chapter 2, he goes on to talk about that power and how we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and God made us alive. So, one of the things, is, as far as why it's important, is number one, I think it just is we, we better understand the scriptures mm-hmm. in understanding these things, we better understand our salvation. In light of these things, we better understand what Christ has done, is doing, and will do for us. And in light of all those things, those things are the fuel for our maturity. That's how we mature. Is That's what we want to mature in, is in the knowledge and grace of God. Yeah, and we don't want to be pagan. No, exactly. <laughs> okay, so I'm not saying our Arminians are pagan, but if you say, I will not believe any verse in the Bible that teaches the election, no matter how clear it is. Mm-hmm. You're saying... God can say some things to me, but God can't say other things. I won't listen to him. And they would say, well, no, no, we're not saying that. Well, and then my debate with Greg Boyd, that's what we're debating about. And yeah, some of you may have saw that. And in my 20-minute intro, I put, a, I put a Bible verse up on the, on the thing. It says, God chose you from the beginning for salvation. Yep. I just, that's in the Thessalonians. I put it on the thing. I said, no, let's. See if we can understand it. Maybe this is hard to understand. <laughs> so I said, who chose whom? God chose. Who did he choose? 
You. Who's you? Christians. When did he do it? From the beginning. What was the result of his choosing us from the beginning? What did he choose us for? Salvation. Salvation. I said, okay, now why can't we understand this? Yeah, How hard difficult. is this? And so, and then we had our debate. You know what was funny, though? Is <laughs> hey, I, don't, I don't know if I was there, and I don't know if Todd, Todd Frail was there, too. And I don't know if he meant to say this, but he said to Greg, he goes, now, Greg, could you tell us why uh, these things don't mean what they say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had all these verses. <laughs> yeah. I, I handed out th- three pages of verses to teach election. Three pages of verses. Four, over 40, right? And I, and I handed these out, and Todd Friel says, well, what are you going to do with all these? And it, Greg Boy's a nice fellow, and in between we were talking with each other, and he says, well, I can see your, why you will... You would hold your position for exegetical reasons. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the that's philosophical. What, philosophical. That's the important, and that it's an epistemological issue. Yeah, it's it's a philosophical one because he can't he can't handle the implication that what God, is the way we know truth as Bibli- as people who believe the Bible and as the source of in sola scriptura yeah. as the source of, of of doctrine and practice. We have to go by what the Bible says, not human yeah. philosophy. I'm always going to choose. I mean, there's systems of theology. My last article was about a certain system. Yep. And you, I'm always going to choose the one that best explains all of the data in the Bible, all of the verses. I'm not going to. I hate to have a biblical, or I hate to have a doctrinal position where I have to keep telling people the Bible doesn't mean what it obviously says. I just can't do that. It, 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 in fact, it, it harms my conscience. I, I used to do that, and that's what made me switch over to this position 22 years ago. My conscience was killing me. That's right, you're next. You just mentioned philosophy. Let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, we stayed away from philosophy mostly in this course and just focused on what the Bible's teaching us. And so say we accept all that. Say we accept everything the Bible says about God's sovereignty and God works in all things to uh, make, make his plan continue. And uh, that includes every little thing, every hair on our head, every event that happens in our lives, right? So um, then why are we not? What, what is then the difference in philosophy between uh, fatalistic determinism and compatibilism? We know that the Bible says they're different. But what is the difference? Looks like Bob's to my brain, it sounds well, like they're chomping at the bit. Kind of the same. It, <laughs> so it, it, put it in different words for anyone else. Um, it's the whole robot question. How are, how are we not just robots if God has truly decided all the events that cause our desires that therefore cause us to choose Him or not? Okay, so that's distinct. But why don't you address the first thing there, Bob? They're related, but all right. Uh, if someone really, really has a need to understand philosophically as best as we can possibly understand how all these things can be, go read Jonathan Edwards' Freedom of the Will. That, there is no better work ever done, and it's almost impossible to read. I'll warn you up front. <laughs> um, the, the way they used English in Edwards' day was the worst in the history of the English language. Uh, <laughs> Now, now, I'm not getting you. The sentences go on this far, and it's almost impossible to read it. I spent a whole summer just read just so I could get through it. But here's I'll give you the bottom line. Fatalism, fatalism teaches things could be no other way. Okay, because all previous causes, everything has a previous cause and a previous cause and a previous cause, and everything that exists now was what happened because of all those previous causes. They could be no other way. Um, what the Bible teaches is that history will be no other way. In other words, it isn't fatalistically determined by some causal process because God himself is an intelligent, personal being who speaks and acts and relates. And he created other intelligent beings, albeit not infinite, yeah. who speak 
and talk and relate and make decisions. From what I understand of fatalism, when I, and, and I confess I haven't really delved into reading this for eight years, so I'm relying on memory, but fatalism by definition is, is purposeless. It could be in no other way, yeah. but there's no purpose yeah. behind there's no, anything. There's no one. intelligent pur- purpose to fatalism. Whereas uh, compatibilism and believing that God has, it, it, in one sense, caused it, it causing everything to occur according to his plan and purpose, as we read in uh, Ephesians 1.11, is the exact opposite of that. He yep. says that there's purpose behind everything. Exactly. Uh, now, Edwards, and Edwards is right about this because traditional Arminianism believes in God's exhaustive foreknowledge. I think I may have mentioned this in another class. Traditional Arminianism says God exhaustively foreknows all that happens, but he doesn't ordain what happens, right? That's, that's how I, I, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, that's and fair. Edwards, through brilliant reasoning, demonstrated that if, if, a, if God exists with foreknowledge before anything's created and knows everything that shall come to pass, then, then everything that shall come to pass is absolutely certain. He used the word necessary, but I'd use the word certain. It will be no other way, as I just said. So every honest Arminian says the future will be no other way than how God's already foreknown it. Mm-hmm. All right? And so Edwards said, if the doc- definition of fatalism is that all events are going to be the way they're going to be, and that it was certain from the founda- before the foundation of the world because of God's foreknowledge, if that's fatalism, then the Arminians and Calvinists are fatalists together. Okay? Because both of our positions are just as fatalistic as, as each other if we want to define it that way. And by the way, this, this is why there's open theism, because open theism would agree with that. So they, the, the way they would respond to that is God does not have foreknowledge. Okay. What's the difference? We've still got a beginning and an end. Yeah, I still it's feel like a robot. Uh-oh. Well, we're think. It's, it, we, we, we'd still say certain. it's fixed. It, it, it's certain. But I, I still think the difference between, uh, if we want to say sovereign compatibilism and fatalism, there's a big difference there. There's, they're both determined, but one has no, one's determined by nothing but uh, mindless cause. That's fatalism. The other is determined by uh, an all-knowing, all-wise God. Again, I don't, I don't think that's a correct definition of determined. I don't think... Biblical theism is deterministic in that sense. Uh, and, and the way you get rid of determinism is by distinguishing between certainty and necessity. Okay? There's a difference between certainty and necessity. Certainty means something will be a certain way. Necessity says it could Couldn't be no be. other way. And that would be certainly related, certainly related to uh, fatalism. And, yeah. and the other thing about robots is we're... Uh, yeah, you already called it. Robots aren't... Thinking, feeling, self-aware uh, beings. There's no self-awareness, thinking, feeling, in robots. So we could argue that that's what I am. Well, that, but all, yeah. all my thoughts and desires are determined by something else that's determined by. But you're not. You, but, but, no, that, but that's precisely what the atheists taught in the early 20th century. What you just said. They, they. I have a quote in one of my. Uh, scholarly articles on our website quoting one of the Bertrand Russell, one of these guys, saying, we might as well wake up to the fact that our thoughts are meaningless. <coughs> they're just electrical impulses. There are people who believe that, but they're not Christian. And one more thing, because this is <laughs> going to go up there. One more thing. Uh, I said this long before I read Edwards. What is freedom if not the consciousness of freedom? In other words, as far as I'm concerned, I make a decision to preach verse X rather than verse Y. That I'm conscious of making a free choice, and I do so. The doctrine of providence simply says God is working through the free choices of all free moral agents to bring to pass his perfect will, perfect will and his purpose and his divine counsel. As long as I'm conscious of freedom... I don't need any more. I don't need any more freedom than the ability to make my decisions. And frankly, when God circumscribed my freedom when he converted me, that was really good. <laughs> <You know? laughs> 
I felt a lot freer to sin yep. when I wasn't convicted by the Holy Spirit. Mike, next. Is somebody back here, too? Two, three? Okay. I just had a quick question on, you know, Ryan, you were saying about Ephesians 1 that Paul was hoping that people would come to a knowledge of the wonderful doctrines of grace and God's praying sovereignty. For yep. Praying for it. Well, does that mean then that those, let's say someone goes their entire life rejecting doctrines of grace, they absolutely despise it, you know, or I don't know what level I guess you could look at, but they just will not accept it. Well, that, and every person, even believers, are going to be judged. Mm-hmm. You know, will those people who refuse to submit to the sovereignty of God, will they be judged for that more harshly in some form? I don't know. That's, I, I, again, I, would, I leave that up to the Lord. That's Christ's prerogative. That's his prerogative. But here's a, uh, another, I know I quote Spurgeon all the time, but I love his quotes. Somebody asked Spurgeon, this is the, they used to always ask this, do you think they're gonna, you're going to see him in heaven? And they asked Spurgeon, you think you're going to, is, Jake, is Arminius, the one who started Arminianism, going to be in heaven? He said, yeah, I hope so, I think so, but he won't, will no longer be an Arminian. <laughs> 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 so you know, I, th- that's the one thing is when we come to the per- you know when we when the perfect comes, we're going to receive the truth, yeah. all of the yeah, truth. We'll all we're gonna, yeah, we're all going to be corrected. We're, 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 yeah, we're no, we all got bad theology somewhere. <laughs> and then the, yeah, may the Lord, may the Lord. That's why we need to be humble before the Word. So that he, that, that he can correct us and awaken us to the areas that, that we are lacking. Yes, Mike. Um, last Sunday you were talking about uh, everlasting life. And uh, in John 17:3, Jesus gives a definition of everlasting life as uh, knowing God and the one he has sent. And, uh, you know, Proverbs talks about uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. So uh, when, when God moves on somebody with the Holy Spirit, he opens their eyes to who God is and that he is someone um, that in his infinite being should be listened to. And as, you're, as you go through sanctification, then he reveals himself more and more to the believer. Through his word. Through his word. And... Um, this revealing, um, you know, and we're looking at compatibilism now and, and sovereignty, and that's one of his attributes. But as you're sanctified, he makes these um, characteristics of himself more clear to believers. And um, it's through his power and through the Spirit that we even come to understand this. Oh, I, yeah, I totally agree. That's, that's one thing that we need to understand is whenever we come into, you know, sal- salvation, coming to God is by grace alone. And sanctification and the renewing of our mind is also a product of God's grace. So we have to understand that, it, you know, obviously compatibilism is involved here because in order to have our mind renewed, we need to en- engage the word. We, and we have a desire to feed on it. But Ultimately, we go back to Philippians, for God is at work in us. So whenever we get to a point where we have some revolutionary breakthrough in theology and we're basking in its glory, and it's true, that's God's grace. Well, in, our mind. And you talked about working out your salvation, and when you study and ponder and try to understand you're working it out, but it's God who finally reveals himself through his word mm-hmm. that is by his power. Yeah, it's all his power. Who was next, Ryan? Do you remember? I don't remember. Let's, oh, yeah, over here. That's let's right. ca- let's cast lots. <laughs> I have a question about the salvation of children and babies, okay. unborn babies, and how it- election... Fits okay. into that. Here, here's the, and again, this isn't going to be very satisfactory. The Bible, I'm convinced, does not speak to this issue. Therefore, since the Bible does not speak regarding it, it's in the realm of mystery. Therefore, 
if the, our best response, and we've, we've talked about other things that are in the realm of mystery in this class, our best response, I think, is to step back and say, we don't know, trust God, for the Lord is good and will do what is right. Um, I know that's hard, and, you know, I, in all honesty, but I think that's the best way, to, best way to go because the Scripture does not speak to that. As is with, um, with, with other things uh, that we've talked about, for instance, uh, you know, the, the mental, I think somebody brought up the issue of people who are you know, mentally retarded or, or, or things of that nature. And I actually had a, a question here about assisted suicide. And that, that's not the same thing. I don't want to say that because I think there's issues, there's implications that can be brought into this. Let me, let me bring that, uh, that, that's a good uh, lead into this. Please address Arminianism's and Calvinism's view of suicide, euthanasia, especially abortion and assisted suicide. Is choice the same as free will? That's a question from online. I don't know if I would really say that uh, um, the whole issue of suicide, uh, abortion, and assisted suicide is really a Calvinistic and Arminian issue. I think there's right. a, that's an equivocating on a term choice. Yep. All right. The, yeah, choice and is the same. Yeah, as see, will. There's, there's, there's God's a, there's, there's a well, difference. There's God's moral will and God's providential will. Okay. So we would say as Christians that it's not God's moral will to kill an unborn baby, all right? So the person doing so may use that, the term choice, to say, well, we should give people the choice to do that. But, yeah, people choose to rebel against God's revealed moral will, but it isn't a legitimate choice. Yeah. It's, it's an act of rebellion. Yeah. And, and the same goes with suicide. Um, God is the one who is sovereign over life and death, and he hasn't given it to us to determine that for either us or somebody else, mm -hmm. right? So the person committing suicide is rebelling, rebelling against God and refusing to live the life that God gave them. So it would be a sinful, Sin. yeah. sinful choice. And I think, in all honesty, I think... There will be tons of there, there, most Arminians and most Calvinists would probably agree with what you just said. Well, I'm sure. So I, it's, I don't it, think it's, yeah. it's, it's as far as Arminianism and Calvinism regarding this issue, I think it's probably an area that there we most even well I don't even want to use that most Bible believing Christians would would agree upon uh, with, with that. But uh, there's obviously always differences yeah. in the, opinion. The issue of choice that, that does affect Calvinism and Arminianism is whether God chose us or we chose God. Right. Okay? In which is given priority. Yeah, exactly. God, when, God chose us first. Yeah, he chooses and us, and when he says effectual grace, we choose God. God. Yep. We actually do make a choice, but not until after we've received the grace that would make us want to do that. If somebody would have, I've said this before, uh, one day before I was converted, if somebody would have told me, that you have the free will choice to go over to that little Pentecostal church and sing old-fashioned hymns by the piano on Sunday night, you're free to go do that. <laughs> I would have told them they were nuts because it wasn't in my nature to go to such churches where they preach the gospel and sing about the blood of Jesus. Yeah. There's no desire there. I had no desire to do that. I would never make that choice because it wasn't in my nature. Then, somebody back there? Yeah, there was somebody else in the back row. Pat, Who had did back? you have one? Or did, did we answer it? We got everybody's. Okay. Okay, um, so the point, the point is, God gives us a new nature, and then we choose to serve him. <laughs> because now we can't think of anything better than serving God, and we can't imagine why we weren't serving him a long time before. Um, just want to respond to what you were saying about um, then we're just no different than a robot. I think um, a robot has, no, of course, no feelings. And I think oftentimes when we think we were serving God, is that we think that we're doing something for him. And actually... I think it's more true than that. I think it's God doing something for us. The relationship that we have with him through our salvation, I think, is this. It's this um, bliss um, as a Christian that I think God allowed for us to have those fulfillment, contentment, um, that you search for nothing else on this earth except looking for those things that would be pleasing to him. So God wants our heart. It's the heart that he wants. Not necessarily our action, but it's our heart. So when you're doing serving God with the desire 
to please him, it is such a privilege mm-hmm. to do that. There, well, and the other thing no, is, is... That's because the Lord is... Yeah, he gives that to you, the desire to do that. And not only that, you know, the, the, um, you know, the Lord is going to be doing things for us for eternity. And I preached on that a little bit uh, this last Sunday when I went into uh, Ephesians 1. That he ra- or is actually Ephesians 2. He raised us up in order that in the ages to come, he will show us the riches of his kindness. Wow. Was there anything else? Last call. Okay, thank you very much. It has been a... Yes? This is for Ryan. Oh, stop. No. (laughs) It was was just as much, if not more, of a pleasure for me to be with you guys. So thank you so much.